Good morning and good afternoon. Thanks again for joining us this month. So this is our third episode in personalization. And uh, it seems like lead scoring was the most logical way for us to uh, wrap up these uh, or this series, this first three for the year. So thanks again for making some time to join us. Let's kick off and uh, we'll get started. So on the line today is myself, Derek Bell, your host and Director of Marketing and Customer Success here at Marketing Cube. And we've also got Sean on the line. Sean is one of our account directors and Sean will be helping uh, from a Q&A and chat point of view. So please feel free to uh, to use those tools throughout the session. Uh, by now, I'm sure you're very familiar with how that works. So just some housekeeping. We use Zoom, as you know, replays are available on the blog and you can access those from marketingcube.com.au uh, at our blog. As I said, please ask questions uh, using the Q&A. Just keep in mind that Q&A is visible to everybody. So uh, don't ask any specifically personal questions uh, for this session, but you can use chat if you'd like to ask a more private question. So what's our plan for the next 60 minutes? Your questions answered. We had uh, only one question submitted um, as of uh, yesterday where we compiled all the details. But uh, we'll get to that. And then our three key topics for today focus around understanding code dynamic lead scoring and engagement and what that really means and what it is. Also looking at key engagement and account retention and account engagement in Eloqua. And so wanting to help you understand how lead scoring can play a role in those three pieces. And then finally looking towards release 23B, which is due in May this year. So Q&A is available throughout, as I said, but if you wanted to wait till the end, you can do that. But again, please feel free to use the Q&A throughout the course of the uh, the webinar. So the one question this month came from Darren in Singapore. Darren is a digital specialist and he kind of had two questions. First of all, does Eloqua have a rhythmic function? Uh, I want to store points into a CDO. Does Eloqua allow one to submit, hang on, sorry. Does Eloqua allow one submit form pass to another form submit via third-party apps? Okay, so, so Darren, we would need to ask you more questions to really be able to more accurately answer this question for you. Excuse me, but fundamentally, yes, is the, is the answer to both of them. The arithmetic function can be done in a range of ways. The contact washing machine is probably one of the more common ways. You can use the contact washing machine both on the the, uh, the campaign canvas, but also the program canvas. We have a number of clients in professional services, uh, both in accounting firms and also law firms, who have to collect points based on different training sessions they run for people within the industry. And so points are, are gathered, et cetera, um, and then accumulated, and, and that information can be shared back to people. That's a very basic use uh, from an arithmetic point of view. But, um, but yes, is kind of the answer. We'd need to understand, as I said, more your specific use case so we can help you understand the best way to do that. Then in relation to allowing one form to pass to another from a third party, yeah, so again, we have a range of clients who have different types of third-party form apps that they use for a range of different reasons. So the answer is yes, but again, we would need to understand in a bit more detail what you're trying to achieve, which third-party app, you're using uh, and the most effective way to do that. And in some cases, not using a third-party form app can also be uh, the answer as well, or at least not in every single case. There's no reason really that every single form you present in Eloqua would need to go through a third-party app. Uh, you'd be surprised as to the power of the, the form function within Eloqua itself. So, uh, so I hope that answers your question. And if anyone else has any questions like that, please feel free to reach out. All right, so co-dynamic lead scoring and looking at the insight it provides of contact engagement. Why co-dynamic? What does that really mean? Well, there are many ways that lead scoring is presented and um, Eloquent can almost lay claim, and certainly as far as I'm aware and looking back over my way too many years in this industry, that uh, Eloquent was one of the first to really provide a lead scoring construct. And it's much more than just simply accumulating, accumulating points for certain types of behavior. So the co, the co-dynamic, so the co is both looking at profile and engagement information. So that's the two things, hence the co. 
And dynamic is the fact that it is in that it is in fact dynamic. A score does go up and down. It's not just an accumulative thing where someone gets five points for this and ten points for that, and the goal is they get to one hundred. That's that's certainly not uh, dynamic. Uh, it just simply is accumulative over time, and probably we would suggest not overly realistic in trying to gauge a person's behaviour or potentially their lack of behaviour uh, within a set period of time. So. By using all sorts of things, and those sorts of things are demographic, firmographic, behavioral, and engagement data, you have a much better likelihood of ending up with a score that is a far better indicator of where a person is at, either in their buying cycle or just simply in relation to their engagement with you as a brand. That's why it's co-dynamic, and that's why it's, uh, we would argue, a little bit special and a little bit different potentially to what you're using today in, in other platforms or whatever you might be doing. So let's have a look in a bit more detail at kind of what it's not, because I think that's just as important to understand. As I said here, you can have some systems which will provide you with the ability to assign points uh, to certain behaviors. It may be that people open an email. And it may be they open a specific email. And so they get five points. They click on an email. Well, that's clearly a better form of engagement. So maybe that's 15 points and then so on and so forth through the exercise. Not all platforms actually allow you to include website behavior as well, by the way. So again, something a little bit different that you can apply. Downside with this is the, the accumulated that somebody may have opened an email five months ago or two years ago. Big deal, right? It doesn't really mean a great deal, potentially if you're looking to understand engagement today and where a person is at today versus what they did potentially two years ago. So the recency becomes a really important part of that exercise as well. Not just simply the fact that they did something, it's how recently did they do it that could also be uh, important. Now, for many of you on the call today, I'm just going to quick look down the line uh, as to who's with us. So we have a mix here of certainly you know, high value B2B uh, type environments. We also have universities uh, attending today. And definitely that's clearly a, it's not B2B, but it's B2C, but it is high value uh, typically. And so where there's high value, there's typically a longer buying cycle. Somebody doesn't simply open an email, then you know, later that day, you know, spend $35,000 on a, a new degree uh, that they want to do or $120,000 on a new car or a million dollars on a new house. Most normal people don't typically make those decisions within a 24-hour period. So understanding the, the length of your buying cycle uh, is a really important part to understanding how to build a lead score model. So today is not so much about how to build a lead score model. Today is assuming you have the model built and we want to now actually maximize the use of that score in a range of different ways. So this is typically how Eloqua will present you with uh, the lead score data. So two points, the co, the co pieces being profile and engagement. So engagement is implicit or implied information. So this is the opening, it's visiting websites, uh, it's visiting specific pages on your website that you may group together. Profile is the explicit information. This is you, you know their job title, you know their job category, you know which state they're in, you know which products they use or which services they've procured from you. So these are explicit pieces of data that you have about them. Now, the most highly qualified or the most, uh, yeah, yeah, that's the right word, the most highly qualified uh, area that we typically look at from a lead score point of view is what we call that A12, B12 area. So it's that top left-hand corner of the, uh, well, it's not really a quadrant, but <laughs> the top left-hand corner that you can see there on the screen. Now, what ranks as a marketing qualified lead within your organization will differ to the next. Some will run with the concept of A12, B12. Some may make it a bit more strict, for instance. So keeping in mind A is our profile and one, two, three, four is our engagement. So maybe the profile at level A and B is sufficient for you in your organization, but you really want them to be maxed out from an engagement point of view. And so maybe it's just A1 and B1. Maybe that's what you determine a marketing qualified lead will be. It's not until you really look at the data and look at the individuals that you can really kind of then make that decision. So there's a bit of a testing process you need to go through 
to validate some of the assumptions and to validate the model uh, that you've built. So that's essentially how we, that, well, it helps you understand what a co-dynamic lead score is uh, and why it's a little bit different to a more standard accumulative type of model of lead scoring. So what I want to do now is dive in and have a closer look at a contact, uh, but also account retention and mix those two together a little bit. The premise of today's session is that it's more than just MQLs, okay? So if we look at your Eloqua database, uh, it grows for a whole range of different reasons. Uh, let's, for argument's sake, say your total contact count within Eloqua is 335,000 unique individuals. And the information or the growth of your database can come from print, from paid, from social, TV, partners. There can be a whole range of ways that you drive people to some type of a form where they need to fill in information in order to access things. And then they, they become a member of your database or a, a subscriber, essentially, of your particular database. Now, for most of you, and as I look again at our list today, most of you have Eloqua integrated to a CRM. And now from a best practice point of view, most CRMs will typically break down your contacts into two categories. Those are leads and contacts. And these are typically two very separate constructs within the CRM by design. And this is the same across NetSuite. It's the same for Oracle Sales Cloud, Salesforce, Microsoft Dynamics. All of these guys out of the box typically will follow this same type of construct. And there's good reason for that. In an ideal world, that will be the same. You'll have 335,000 contacts in Eloqua and a total of 335,000 contacts sitting over in the CRM. Now that is the Nirvana state. And typically the day you turn Eloqua on and switch the integration or turn the integration on, that's, that's probably the only time that both will be exactly the same because you'll end up with contacts and leads in the CRM that don't have an email address, for example. You will end up with duplicates in the CRM where multiple contacts have the same email address, for example. So they'll never be the same, okay? But let's have a look at an alternative as to how that might work. So the alternative is that we create a threshold, okay? And the threshold could be, like I used before, the example of A1, A2, B1, or B2. Maybe in your world, that's what constitutes a marketing qualified lead. So we still have the same number of inputs coming in and people filling in forms and your Eloqua database is growing and let's say it's 335,000 people. But over here in the CRM, it's actually a little bit different. Now we're down to 15,000 leads. Okay, the reason for the drop is because marketing is now controlling the flow of leads into the CRM platform. So it means that the CRM user, typically sales and service, won't see those leads until they meet a specific threshold. And you can determine whatever that threshold is. And it's not a binary game, by the way. You can, you can override that function. So if a particular individual fills in a form, they may be uh, maybe just a, a score of B3, for example, but they fill in a form asking for somebody to contact them. Well, marketing doesn't need to hold on to that. We need to shoot that directly into the CRM and get the outbound phone call happening. So you can control that. And the integration with Eloqua is smart enough to help you manage that on a form-by-form -form basis uh, should you need to. That's where the difference can come in. Now, from a sales and marketing alignment point of view, this becomes really, really helpful because you can now provide the, the sales team or the service or whoever's making outbound phone calls to prospective customers or clients or students, then you can now help them prioritize their time a little more effectively. Sales has a way to prioritize the leads that uh, that they'll engage with. And the way you can do that is by actually disclosing the lead score within the CRM platform. So whether it be the lead and contact object, you can do it both. Uh, it would be the same lead score. And um, once the, the person is converted or the lead is converted to a contact, the lead score will follow that particular individual. Now, once it's actually in the CRM and assigned against a lead or a contact, you then have the ability to produce reports. And so you can prioritize certain behaviors. So an individual salesperson can look at their region, uh, look at the contacts or leads that they are assigned, and then filter those people who are more highly uh, qualified. 
by way of the lead score. So it certainly helps you communicate very smoothly to the sales team or to the service team, uh, the level of engagement of a particular individual uh, along with the profile of that particular individual. Now, the critical part in this whole process though, and this is probably a little bit selfish of us on the marketing side of the fence, is that we need to get feedback, okay? So leads will come through and not every single lead will be a sales qualified lead, maybe marketing qualified, but at some point sales will certainly reject some of those leads. What we wanna try and do is ensure there's some degree of empirical value in that process, that it's not just, oh, they didn't like us, or <laughs> we need to find some agreeable categories that you can assign to why a particular lead is rejected. Now, I would encourage you to probably limit that list to probably no more than five or eight reasons potentially, and make it a single select pick list. Don't have a huge long list, have, a, have it show, maybe you know, no budget or um, not buying yet or uh, yet to make a decision, or there could be a whole range of different things. It's gonna be unique for everybody. Everybody's you know, objections a little bit different, but you certainly wanna do that in consultation with the sales team. That way you can then receive that information, look at it in detail and look at how you can potentially modify the lead score model to help you deliver better marketing qualified leads through to the sales team. So that feedback is really critical and it would be the same for uh, opportunities. So if opportunities are being managed within your CRM platform by the sales team, then if a opportunity is lost, then there should be a reason assigned as to why it was potentially lost. Now, is it something marketing has control over? It may or may not be. But the more information you have, the better you can refine that lead score model. And the better your lead score model is, the better you can be at building campaigns to target these people. It really just kind of goes around in a bit of a circle and a really positive circle. So an engagement score. So when we think about the concept of a lead score, and that's exactly what it's called within most platforms and certainly within Eloqua, is it's a lead score. But the nice thing about the Eloqua lead score is that engagement plays a really, a really big part in that exercise. And so at Marketing Cube for many years, we've had what we've called an engagement score. It's just using the lead score model, but with a little bit of a difference. You can set the lead score profile to target data that identifies customers. And here I'm talking about people who are paying you for services, not people who are yet to pay you. So when I say customer, I don't use that term generically. I'm very specifically referring to people who are currently paying you for services or have bought products from you and are true customers from that point of view. So set the profile data to really identify customers, which is then going to push everybody else out essentially. So partners, prospects, et cetera, put them down towards the bottom, weigh them, uh, weight them very differently. Then set the lead score engagement to focus on your customer oriented campaigns. So there will be a range of campaigns that I'm sure you would run over time that are more targeted uh, to your customer a customer base versus your prospect base or partners or other audiences that you might communicate with. You can identify contacts with a lead score, for example, A4 or B4. So remember, A is your high profile uh, and 4 is really low engagement. So the absolute right profile, so they're definitely up there, they're a customer, but 4 would indicate there's very little engagement happening. So it helps you immediately to identify and look at some other ways to engage this audience and trying to re-engage. We'll talk about re-engagement here in just a moment. But remember, not all contacts are equal. So yes, we can apply the lead score and we can use it from an engagement point of view, but uh, we want to make sure that there's some um, human, inter human interaction happening and that we are looking at it on a somewhat regular basis to continue to validate and make sure that the model is, is right. Uh, setting and forgetting your lead score is probably not the best idea. Uh, we encourage those people who do use active lead scoring models to probably at least schedule a quarterly review uh, of those. And certainly if you've got feedback coming back from the CRM platform, from the CRM user community, then absolutely let's make sure that feedback is received and analyzed and looked at. And, and looking for opportunities to refine a lead score model. Better audience design. This is a really important part. So this is kind of where we're getting to from today's topic, really. 
it's looking at using that lead score to really tailor segments. Okay. So let me give you some examples to give you some examples that we could focus on. So let's say you're running a breakfast event. Now, a breakfast event, um, you're probably looking at anywhere from you know 80 to $120 a head uh, by the time you add in all the bits and pieces that are needed. And so it's a high value event typically for you. And so depending on the objective uh, that you have, maybe using your lead score filter is one layer of filters that you might apply as to who you want to invite to the event. So you will typically, in most organizations, you receive a fixed list. So the sales team will say, I need these 50 people invited. I need these 180 people invited, et cetera, et cetera. Look, that's great. I'm sure that's wonderful. Um, that's fine. Go ahead and add all of that. But what you can then do is apply a filter using your lead score model to say, well, you know what, guys? Of that list you've given us, actually, these 30 are far more engaged than these other ones. Okay, so it's another way to potentially look at filtering and targeting uh, your audience with a bit more uh, uh, empirical knowledge. All right, let's say same thing. Let's say we invite that same group, A12, B12 leads to a breakfast event where they have an open opportunity with a stage that is not closed one. So this is now using more information uh, from a segmentation point of view. It's now combining our lead score model along with the integration that shows us the level of opportunity and the stages of the opportunity within the, within the CRM platform. So, and, and you may be that you want to exclude people with an open opportunity, depending on the nature of the event, obviously, and the topic and what your objectives are and so on and so forth. So he's now starting to use your lead score to help you identify that audience in a bit better way. Now, you may want to exclude. So say you're running a, a webinar and a, and a webinar is a, a reasonably low cost venture. And so generally most people are more comfortable with inviting a, a wider range of people to those types of events. However, maybe your highly valued or highly scored leads, they're in a different campaign. They're heading in a different direction. You've got other things along the way. Pretty much everything you're going to cover in the webinar has probably already been covered with this particular audience. So in this case, you may choose to use the lead score model to help you with an exclusion versus an inclusion. Now, the re-engagement campaign that I talked about before. So if we think about it from a re-engagement point of view, those who are potentially the right sort of profile but are not showing really good engagement could be another way to look at things. And I'm just thinking here, did I in fact put that around the right way? Yeah, maybe that should be sort of A or B instead of C, but the two, three, four. What we're looking at, if I go back a slide, what we might be looking at is people who fit the profile uh, of definitely the right sort of uh, people you want to talk to, but their engagement is in fact very low. So if their engagement is low, there are things we want to do to obviously try and progress them forward. Now, you can either think about that from a lead point of view or from a customer point of view. So the customer may well be uh, the right um, the right profile fit. They're definitely A, so that means they're, they're definitely a customer. However, their engagement is very low. So you could use your lead score model to help you target that group of people, specifically trying to get them a little bit more engaged and get them a bit more involved. All right, let me show you what that might look like in, in Eloqua so you can see how you would build and how you would actually use the lead score model within segments to, to combine this. That last bullet point actually is if you've got data coming back that shows you that leads, and this is available within the integration, by the way, so this is this is not difficult, you can deliver more targeted nurturing campaigns to leads that were rejected by sales. Now, if we have reasons as to why a lead has been rejected, you may have some always on style campaigns that those rejected camp, uh, rejected leads could fall into. So for instance, if you're able to identify that there's no decision going to be made for another 12 months, maybe you put them into a, a wait step on a campaign and the first thing is to wait for nine months, potentially. And then you start to re-engage with that particular audience. And if you have other objections that you feel as a marketing team, you're able to obviously overcome and, and provide more information to a person, then again, you can drop them into a relevant campaign to suit. But what does that look like in Eloqua? So here is the segment builder, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. 
And you may or may not have noticed on the right-hand side, when you're looking at all of those filters, is the compare lead score model. So what you'll see here, it double click, it, it comes into the middle of the screen, you double click again, and here you're able to pick and choose what the lead score equals. So in this particular example, what I've done is identify what we at Marketing Cube would identify as a marketing qualified lead. So an individual that is either A, B, one, two, okay? A, one, two, or B, one, two. Then you'll notice there's a, a final drop down there here, sort of select lead scoring model. So if you have multiple models that are active, you can obviously then select which one you're using. So if you have a true lead score model, versus a customer engagement uh, model, then you can select whichever one you need. We use this one a little bit. Some of you uh, on the call today, and maybe most of you, depending on your overall engagement with us, would have received an email from us last week letting you know that the office would be closed over the Easter break. We choose not to send those emails to every customer. The reason for that is that 95% of our customers are all on exactly the same vacation. You know that it's uh, Easter long weekend. You're also going to be <laughs> off work. What we like to do, though, is use engagement score uh, from a customer point of view to look at those customers who are more highly engaged to share that information. We do fix it, though, making sure our key executive contacts and eloquent administrators, they will always get those communications. And in there, we provide information on you know, how to log a service request if you need to while the office is closed and contact details, et cetera. And then we usually say, share some uh, silly recipe. Uh, <laughs> why a recipe? Well, why not, right? So it's a, a holiday. So usually there's food involved for most people. And so we like to throw in a fun recipe. Uh, along the way. That's one way we use the engagement score to not hit everybody in the database. As I've said, it's probably really not necessary. Um, and it's just a little bit of fun more than anything else. So this is one way we do it. The other way we do it is probably one of the most effective ways that we would use it in the construct of events. So when we run events, one of our objectives is to always try and make sure we have customers and prospects mixing at those events. It's we want to make sure we're obviously delivering value for the customer, that there's you know, good information and, and it's worthwhile them attending that event. Uh, and obviously having prospects there is great as well. So if we can have those two parties mixing, that works really well. But at the same time, we want to make sure we invite customers who are engaged and who are you know, utilizing our services, who are participating in the user group potentially, who are visiting our website and, and finding hopefully answers to questions there as well. And, but, and so the lead score, the engagement score uh, helps us determine that. And that's how we build that audience a little bit more effectively. Okay, so account engagement. Account engagement, or even going so far as to call it account-based marketing, which I suppose follows on from account engagement. Taking all of that information that we've focused on so far, it's all focused on individuals. So we've been looking at lead scores against an individual person or a contact. We've been looking at the same thing from a customer point of view, but looking at an individual customer in that construct. Well, for many years, people have been using Eloqua to do account-based marketing. It's just that there's this term now applied over the last five or so years called account-based marketing, not new, uh, but just a new name, I suppose. And so... To help with that, uh, Oracle has developed a, and it is an add-on to Eloqua, part of their intelligence package, which helps ABM marketers to more effectively gain the insight they need at an account level. And so what they've done is what kind of what we've been doing for years, but looking at it in a little bit more robust way and also being able to deliver you a great dashboard uh, as well, uh, which is something that takes a little bit more effort without this type of uh, uh, this type of add-on. If you're looking to do ABM, and I know many on the call, again, as I scan down the list, yeah, there's many of you on the call who are in fact doing uh, ABM today. Something like this may well help you and be quite helpful. There are certainly some considerations you need to think about in relation to the way your integration is set up. And I would suggest most of you probably already have it set up correctly. But what it does, it enables you to look at an account engagement score 
Notice it's referred to as an engagement score, not a lead score. So a lead score, again, would imply an individual uh, in this context, but the engagement is referring to the account as a whole. And then also it delivers a dashboard. And I've got a screenshot here to show you what that dashboard looks like. So now you're able to get a view at an account level of those accounts who are more engaged versus those which are less engaged. And the same construct would apply uh, whether they be customers or potentially whether they be prospects. Now, for some of you, as I think of all the universities, for example, and we have a couple of people on the call who are in a more traditional B2C type of environment, that account construct is not really something that you spend a lot of time thinking about. You're far more focused on individuals and individuals progressing through a process to potentially buy your services or your products. However, for those in, say, FinServe or uh, the legal industry, the printing industry, those would become more account-oriented. And so this is where something like this can certainly help and be a little bit more helpful. So this is a, a screen grab of what you could expect to see from an account performance point of view. So what are we looking at? So the score here uh, is the engagement score for the account as a whole. Okay, so this particular account, Big Computers, has a score of 28, and we can see there's been a 2% there's been a increase in that score over the last week. So obviously something's happening, there's some engagement going on, which is good. The number of activities that have happened, so an activity is, you know, opens, it's click-throughs, form submissions, etc., all broken down, um, and you can see there's been a lot of activity. Now, for engaged contacts, now there are reachable contacts. It says here there are 971 reachable contacts within that particular account. That's clearly a very big account. Uh, um, but there are 328 who are more engaged, okay? So that uh, gives you a size of the account. And this is where ABM really comes into its own, I suppose, when you look at numbers like that. So you have an engagement timeline. You can see the filter has been applied up here in the top left-hand corner for the last 90 days. And you can see the number of activities in May and June increased exponentially compared to April. Uh, and along with that, the engagement score has also increased, uh, as you see. Then it gives you recent contact activity. So you'll notice this is now looking at an individual contact level. So Michael Smith and James Johnson and Kimmy McLemore uh, are all individuals that make up, or they're part of this 328, okay? So you can see typical icons that you're familiar with, you know, sending emails, clicking, opening, form submissions, et cetera. And then you can see which of the assets that are being used within that account that seem to be getting uh, the most activity uh, in them, okay? And also the campaigns as well, looking at click-throughs, form submissions, opens, uh, you can see there. So that from a, an account management point of view or account performance point of view, is a dashboard that you can expect to see. Now, again, just to reiterate, this is an add-on uh, for Eloqua. It's not included in it's not included in any of the base. It is an add-on, I believe, for all three, including enterprise. If you've got any questions, of course, about any of these, please feel free to reach out to us. We can help you understand that and, and share a little bit more with you and why that's a benefit and how it can help. But, um, but yeah, so I just want to make sure you were aware that that information is available. Now, how you actually do it, so it's referred to as Eloqua Advanced Intelligent Cloud Intelligence Cloud Service. And it basically what it's doing, it's leveraging the account engagement score to give you a clear cut view of each account's level of engagement. The way it does this, and it gives that score. So you saw, I think the score we saw there was 38. And so the score is assigned between zero to 100. Now it's not taking the consideration profile, it's really just, excuse me, looking at engagement. There are two ways of determining accounts. And based on these, there are two different methods in the way you view the account score. Let me show you what they look like. So the key difference, and most of you, if you've had your instance of Eloqua and your CRM integrated by Marketing Cube, and you have an account construct, then it's highly likely number one has been configured for you. So number two, the big difference there is that what you can't see is the engagement score on an account record. And that just limits then a little bit about what you're able to see on the dashboard. So essentially, when you log into Eloqua, let me just quickly show you. When you go into Eloqua and you go to contacts, put an asterisk and hit return, you'll see you know, a million contacts. 
If you go to the account object in Eloqua and type in an asterisk and hit return. Now, if you see information contained on that particular screen, then that's a positive thing. If you don't see anything, if that account object is in fact blank, then that means you need to start playing with option number two. I would encourage you to have a think about that though, because really option one is kind of where you want to get the most information out of the two. So, but again, if you're, it depends, it will depend. I mean, there are some people on the call who, for instance, using uh, some with Salesforce CRM, they may use a person account construct, which is not really accounts in the traditional sense of a business uh, entity. Uh, it's a person. Okay. So, um, to think that one through but just want you to be aware as to what those two are and, and a quick very quick way that you can see the difference between those two so andrew's question is i assume eloqua wouldn't recognize duplicate accounts if the company name is slightly different when it's actually integrated uh that is your accounts andrew are integrated uh with eloqua each account would in fact have uh, an account ID, so a unique value from the CRM platform. So you might have 25 different companies called AJ Smith and Son. They may all be called exactly the same thing, but in reality, they would have unique account IDs that would be visible in the back end. Um, and so then that would enable you to, to look at the individual and unique accounts. Okay. It's actually not really the name of the account that is the issue. It's the account ID. As long as the account ID is unique, that's what's really going to drive uh, number one uh, for you. Hopefully that answers your question. The manual, the manual uploading of account data and not having it integrated with a CRM can make it a little bit clumsy and a little bit more onerous to try and maintain to get a more uh, effective and accurate picture uh, from the advanced intelligence suite. We would strongly encourage people to look at integration, not just manually uploading account information. Because the thing that you need to then be able to do is take all of the relevant contacts that are associated to that account. And with the CRM integration, that all happens beautifully and it's really easy to do. Uh, having to manage that manually can be a little bit of a challenge and an unnecessary challenge if integration is an option uh, between the two platforms. Thank you for submitting that question. All right. Well, that moves us on to what's new and what's next with 23B uh, that's coming up. So 23B uh, looks to be, hopefully, a pretty special release. Now, Eloqua uh, and Oracle have their safe harbor statement, which um, I won't repeat. I'm sure you've all seen it a thousand times. But that's where basically they can promise you all sorts of things. But until it actually gets delivered, things can change. So with that in mind, you may remember if you had, if you attended in, uh, was it February, uh, user group 23A had just rolled out, there was indication from Oracle that we would expect a significant change to the user interface with Eloqua. So that was promised for 23B. Now this coming Friday, I think it is at 1 a.m. my time here in Sydney, there will be the formal release uh, by the Eloqua product team, uh, which will give us more detail about release 23B uh, and when that's happening. The dates so far that have been publicly uh, shared are those that you can see on the screen right now. I've also put in August and November for you as well, but 23B is our focus. The user group next month will fall just after pod one, pod two, and pod seven go live uh, with release 23B. And it's my expectation that when you log in on the Monday following those, and those dates are US by the way, but so for Australia, it just happens on the Saturday, Sunday, I think it is uh, for both or for pods one, two and seven, that same weekend. When you come to work on Monday, you're gonna have a fairly dramatically different experience from a user interface point of view. Now, if you attended any of the details, you saw a little bit of a glimpse potentially with 23A. The way things, well, what we've been told, <laughs> I'm just sharing with you what I've been told, the way things work hasn't changed. It's simply the interface and the amount of information that is presented to you has changed. Now, my initial observations from what I've seen is really good. Uh, I'm 
pretty excited about this change. I think it's going to be quite significant, but I think it's also going to enable us to be more productive uh, in a range of different ways. But with any change, it comes trauma for some people. If you're a change junkie like I am, then you're probably going to love it. Uh, if you're not a change junkie, uh, you're probably going to be in the depths of despair for maybe a week uh, <laughs> until you organize yourself and kind of figure out where things are. We will have access. Marketing Cube happens to be on pod one, which means we will be complete uh, on that release by Saturday night, the 6th of May, I think it is. So pretty much all day Sunday and most of Monday, we'll be getting into it and diving into it as quickly as we can and navigating around as much as we possibly can so that when you guys hopefully join us for the user group next month uh, uh, in May, that we'll be able to hopefully just be a little bit ahead of the curve for you uh, and to be able to provide you with a little bit more insight uh, and maybe just quickly identify perhaps if there are significant changes to the way things are done, perhaps, that we can hopefully find those and share those with you and, and keep you up to date. So we certainly want to make sure that you extend invitations to the rest of your team uh, to join us. I do have a QR code here, which I'll give you in a moment if you've got your phones handy, that you can at least save the date uh, and drop that date into your calendars uh, as well. But let's jump ahead. The So really, uh, this month is more of a recap. Now, that QR code uh, will subscribe you to the uh, important update communication. So that's our uh, quarterly email that goes out in the contact of, of Eloqua. So this is just a recap of 23A, which was delivered in February. We covered this last month and actually the month before. Key things, insight changes, so helping you build more on-brand reports within Eloqua Insight. Uh, which is helpful. So your colors, your logos, et cetera, it makes it look a bit nicer, uh, which as marketers, we appreciate. So that's a good thing. The email frequency by email group report is a new one. So sometimes if you're concerned, oh, are we delivering too many emails within that is what we're doing? If you want to get that data, you previously have been able to look at the email frequency report. Now what we can do is be a little bit more granular and access an email frequency by email group report because it's highly likely your different email groups, the frequency is actually quite different. So rounding it all up is somewhat helpful, but being able to now look at it by email group, I think is more helpful. So have a look at that one if you like, email frequency by email group. Uh, the automated uh, certificate management will have more information, I suppose, as of this Friday in relation to what that means. But that's all about managing those certificates for you, which Oracle is is taking on board, which is a huge plus, a great value add. They're not charging uh, for it, which is nice. It just means that your uh, SSL certificates and all those sorts of things are managed uh, by Eloqua, which is, as I said, I think it's a, it's a great move and it's a really good service. Mm -hmm. The other pieces, if you're using the Eloqua SMS uh, function, so not Marketing Cube's SMS function, but the Eloqua SMS function, more things to help you with segmentation filter updates, holder management, being able to store those things in a little bit more logical sense is good. The Eloqua Form Application API. So the only reason you're going to see this is if you and a colleague, for example, are sitting directly next to each other, now you could be one at home and one at the office, by the way, but just help me with the analogy. You're sitting next to each other. You're both looking at exactly the same form. You're making changes on it and you both hit save. Somebody has to win, okay? And so in the past, what happens, whoever kind of hits save first won and their save, their changes were made and the others potentially lost. So what you'll get now is an error message on screen. Now it's highly unlikely that you'll ever see that error message. That's a, it's a slim chance that'll ever happen. But if it does happen, you will get an error message at least to prompt you to hey, say, hang on a minute, do you want to copy this? Uh, what do you want to do? Uh, because someone else is trying to do exactly the same thing. The moving of the Eloqua instance. So we talked before about pod one, pod two, pod three. That's where your that's where your instance of Eloqua physically sits on a server. So pod one, for instance, I believe is in Toronto, Canada. Uh, pod seven is based here in Sydney, Australia. Those servers are all being upgraded uh, and moving to Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, which is OCI. And I think the last ones to go are in fact pods one and two. And so for those on pods one and two, it should be, I think the middle May 
I they said the middle of this year. So I'm not sure if it's to do with the release cycle, but it should be around the middle of this year. Okay. Then Oracle Cloud Accounts. Now this one really is majorly important for your uh, Eloqua administrator. So if you've got any challenges with this one, again, if you subscribe to that particular, again, that QR code, if you subscribe to the update, important updates, you'll receive more information about this one. Basically what uh, Oracle is needing you to do is to go into Eloqua, into the settings area, and confirm an Oracle Cloud account to either create a new one or match it with an existing one. So if you are an Oracle client using other cloud solutions like Oracle Sales Cloud or Oracle Service Cloud, et cetera, it's about linking all of those accounts together in a single place so that they can all be seen together by your Oracle administrator. Uh, then the other one was Salesforce App Enhancements. Loads more of those have been added over the last four months. Each release, we keep seeing more updates, which is great. So if you're a Salesforce CRM user uh, and obviously using Eloqua, then let's make sure you're up to date and understand that there are some enhancements. Our team are typically pretty good at staying on top of that uh, and sharing that information with you and try to take advantage of any of those enhancements as they happen. So, uh, so that should hopefully not be new use, new news. Okay, so here's the save the date. So if you wanted to use your uh, smartphone to scan that particular QR code that's on the screen, the enhancements, as it said, that we're expecting are part of Oracle's Redwood design principles. And I think I've shared with you over the last couple of years what that looks like. And what we're seeing in Eloqua today is part of that Redwood redesign. And Redwood is, uh, that's why the giant Redwood trees in the background, by the way, very subtle. Hope you picked that up. The Redwood design is, is look, I'm, I'm sold. I love it. I think it's great. It, from Oracle's point of view, if you're a client using multiple Oracle products, what it's going to do is provide you with a seamless move from one Oracle product to the next. So whether you're using Oracle Service Cloud, you're using Eloqua, you're using Oracle Sales Cloud, the interface that you're using will be the same as you progress around the various platforms, uh, which is great. So whether it's ERP, doesn't matter what it is, um, that'll all follow these same Redwood design principles. So that's going to be the, the big fun for May uh, with release 23B. So we're looking forward to that. Hopefully you can join us. Uh, replays will be available of today's session uh, on our website within a month, sorry, within a month, within a week or so. But please, happy to stay on the line if you do have any questions and wanted to talk through any of the points that we discussed today. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed today's session. Gave you some ideas to play with lead scoring and how you can personalize some campaigns a little bit further using your lead score or potentially your engagement score. Thank you everybody and have a wonderful week.